All right. All right, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> What's up, fucking Miamis? So, you're writing a book about someone that we all know and used to love, now we hate. Yeah. What's going on with that? So oddly, um, I think you all reached out, the conference reached out for me to talk before it was clear what I was doing. So this is just an accident that I'm writing this book. But um, so I'll, I'll tell you how it came about. Yeah. Uh, in September of 2021, I had a call out of the blue from a friend who ran a Wall Street firm. And he, it was a really odd call. He said, I've got a problem. I'm about to do a deal where I'm going to exchange shares in my company with, a, with another company. It's like a couple of hundred million dollar deal. And I'm very comfortable with the company, but I just don't know the guy. The guy who runs it, I, I just can't get a read on him. And he says his name is Sam Bankman Freed. <laughs> and, 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 and I'd never heard, I'd never heard of Sam Bankman Freed. I, I, and so he said, he said, this is a weird call. He says, but I know what you do is you sit down with people, you try to figure them out. He says, I've called all over the, like Wall Street, everybody I know, and nobody knows who he is or like what he's really like. Could you sit down with him for a couple of hours and just give me a report? So, you know, why not? It was kind of thing. I, I, I didn't, not in a million years, I think, oh, I'm going to write about Sam Bankman Freed. So two weeks later, comes tumbling out of an Uber at my office in Berkeley, you know, a mop of hair and shorts and the T-shirt. Did he have a slick soil with him? And, uh, and the limp socks. And what I didn't realize, he's like always dressed for a hike, but has never been on one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 but, and, but I, so I saw him, I thought, we'll go for a hike. Almost killed him. Uh, but, but so we went for a walk and, and I asked him lots of questions. And at the end of the walk, he left and two things happened. First thing is I called my friend and I said, go ahead, do the deal. What could go wrong? Uh, uh, and, the, the, and the second thing was, I, is I thought, like, I just want to see what happens to this person. Um, I, that, I, you know, through my career, I, through, you know, hard experience, one of the things that I've learned is it's just much easier for me to do what I do if I have a character that I, that I want to attach a reader to. And, it, you know, it's like, it's so character-based. And if I forget that, if I like, I start with some argument or some point of view or whatever, it gets boring pretty quickly. But if I start with a character and I just say, I don't know what the story is, I don't know, I don't know what the point of the thing is, I just want to, I want to observe the person in the situation, things tend to work out. They just like do. And I, but if I go the other direction, it doesn't work out. So I called Sam and I said, this is odd. I don't know what this is but could I just watch? I just want to attach myself. I want to be a fly on the wall. Uh, and he said, sure. So this, so this is now we're kind of the end of 2021. And I, I just started doing that. And I don't want to go on too long about this, yeah. but I would just, I'll tell you the, the, what was odd about it was I got to end of October of last year and I thought, and I had material, like, you know, I had stuff that was going to be fun to write and I had a character that I had kind of, I thought I had a kind of a bead on. And, and I, but I thought, I, I don't have a book. I, I, I didn't know where, I, in fact, I had this conversation with kind of a person I use as a sounding board, very end of October. I don't know if I'm going to write this. I've spent a year doing it and I just have all this stuff. And he said, my friend said, your problem is you don't have a third act. You have the first two acts, but you don't have a third act. And I said, that's absolutely right. I don't know where, I don't know how to end it. A week later, <laughs> a week later, FTX blows up. I was so grateful. <laughs> I had busted my ass for a year. I mean, I, this was not trivial. I, inter I interviewed. We talked. We, I interviewed you. Yeah. I got, right? So, I mean, I, I talked to 100 people. I got to know all those people around him. Miss Shad Singh and Caroline Ellison. Gar I mean, you don't get to know Gary Wang, but anyway, I got to know I interviewed the employees, investors, in good times. The Bahamas officials, U.S. regulators, I got to do, I like did the whole thing. And I, there was stuff, but it didn't, I couldn't start it because I didn't know how it ended. <laughs> so so um, this is the thing about characters. They do generate stories. 
And uh, this is a look. So what you will say now is you lucked out. I lucked out. Mm -hmm. That I, I could. I was entirely capable in October of last year of just saying, not going to write it. I don't. It's not going. There, there's so many books in the world already. Who needs another mediocre one, right? It's like if they suck. They're, you know, there are 60,000 other books that suck that come out every year. Why, why write another one of those? Only write it if it could be great. And this guy, whatever else he did, I just have to not screw it up. Uh, it, it is, it's, as you probably can guess, it's just like great stuff. Yeah, you know, you've you already sold the movie rights. Some of my friends were joking, maybe Jonah Hill could be SBF in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this is your, this world. So there's crypto land and there's Bitcoin land, which is a different land from crypto land. Oh, they, they, they made sure to tell us that. I, I, under, I completely got, <laughs> they're like, I, like, I completely understand this. I completely understand this. And I, that I, so I don't, I'm not conflating things, but, but both lands, pretty great storytelling machines. Like stuff just happens. It's like financial version of Kanye. If you're just, <laughs> just next to the, if you're just like next to this stuff, stuff is just happening. And uh, but the so this one of the, uh, the we can move on for this. But it, but the movie, it's interesting about movies. So I've had three of my books turned into movies: Big Short, Moneyball, Blindside. And they've all, it's all been great. It's all taken forever to happen. I, I I don't set out to write a movie. I set out to write a book. Movie is a completely different thing. Um, in this case, when FTX blew up, it was also in the newspapers that oh, Michael Lewis has been seen coming out of the Orchid apartment in, in you know the Bahamas 50 times. And I, it's like it was just there, out there, and I it almost could not not sell the movie rights. It, and it was I mean, of course, when you're going to make millions of dollars, you definitely could not not sell the movie. You could not make. <laughs> and the reason there are a couple of reasons I couldn't not sell the movie rights. Um, one was that it's so obviously, there's so obviously the potential for a great movie in it, that there's the risk that all the talent's gonna go attach, get attached to something that, something less or something other. So you wanna let people know it's out there. Um, and the other was there were people trying to bury me and it, and I just wanted to have an ally. Uh, that there are, it's not that loud, but there are a bunch of people who would just rather me not write this book and certainly would rather ha have a movie not made. And I wanted to have an Apple or an Amazon or a Netflix on my side in the event of that. So I sold the rights to Apple. But anyway, I'm writing it now. I wrote, was writing this morning and I'm gonna leave here and I'm gonna go continue to write because I've got a deadline of a couple of months from now. And, and I hope you all will enjoy it. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, and, uh, and I'm grateful for the invention of crypto. Uh, I, Do you, okay, well, let's go, I have a question. Is, yeah. Do you own any Bitcoin? It's, it's in the FTX bankruptcy. <laughs> so, 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 so you learn not your keys, not so your do I, I don't know, do I own it? So this is a good question. I, 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 th 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 so the, that's a cheeky answer, but the, look, the truth is that I needed to see that the thing, that, that it worked, like I could buy, I could use it, get a credit card off it, all the stuff they said they could do. So I, it wasn't much. I didn't buy, like, put a whole lot of money into Bitcoin. Um, it's, the, the, I did, so in 2012, I did get, I did get given some Bitcoin by people who wanted me to write about it. And they took my phone out of my hands, they put an app on it, a wallet, they gave me a, enough money to buy a cup of coffee and walked to a coffee shop with me in Palo Alto to show me that you could buy a cup, a cup of coffee with Bitcoin. They had arranged for the coffee shop to accept Bitcoin. And we, and we got there and 15 minutes later, you still couldn't pay for the cup of coffee. So they just let me, I gave cash and they let me keep the Bitcoin. Like a year later, I looked down on my phone. It was like, Jesus Christ, it's $500 worth of Bitcoin now. Yeah. So I quickly sold it because I didn't know what it was. And I was afraid that it was going to lose. So, but that was my other experience with owning Bitcoin. But the rest of my Bitcoin is owned now by John Ray and the FTX bankruptcy. Interesting. So, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I come, I come in peace. Oh, of course. You know, right. I mean, it's not like it's, I, I, it's, it's uh, the truth. The, the the whole question of like why or why I, I wouldn't own Bitcoin is in a larger discussion about what I do with my money, which is really boring stuff. I hate thinking about it, so I just don't think about it. I don't do very much with it. It's just like give some to Warren Buffett, put some in you know municipal bonds. I just don't. I like to just. <laughs> I, I like to just think about. I think about. I'd rather spend my time thinking about books. 
or so stories. Let's, let's move back in time a bit. So I've, I've been a fan and, a, and read your stuff. Uh, have you? I have read your stuff. You didn't say that when I called you to interview you. You well, looked I mean, a little nervous and you seemed a little well, standoffish. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, um, so you've written about obviously the financial crisis 2008 and we're at a Bitcoin conference. We may or may not be in a banking crisis right now. Like, how do you see any parallels? You know, you know, having you know, spoken to a lot of people in Bitcoin, like, do you see some cultural differences? What do you think about the, the whole scene? Like the... The ethos, just like yeah, the, the feeling the, you get when you speak to us. Digital, digital financial world versus act, the, the old financial world. How do I see them? There are a bunch of things that come to mind. Um, so one of the interesting things to me is, and again, Bitcoin's one thing and crypto land's another, but there's some overlap. And uh, if you go back to Satoshi's original paper, you know, line one, paragraph two, is you eliminate the need for a trusted financial intermediary. Clearly the very beginning of the spirit of the enterprise is mistrust of the existing financial institutions, well-earned mistrust <laughs> on the back end of the financial crisis. And um, so you would think that that would generate a very mistrustful environment. Instead, what happens is lots of institutions get generated inside of crypto that have unbelievable amounts of trust bestowed on them by the people in crypto. Like, it's a really trusting environment. People getting burned left and right, and they're still here, right? <laughs> On the other hand, the original financial system is premised not on mistrust, but trust. It's like, it's on the currency, right? And, and the, it depends entirely on, like, trusted financial intermediaries. But nobody trusts any of these places as far as you could throw them. Like, I mean, it's like, this, it's, it's, a, it's this curious, there's this curious almost mirror image thing going on between the, the two worlds. The current, like, my, um, when, my, when I first encountered the idea of being able to use the blockchain technology as a way to disintermediate financial intermediaries, I thought, thank God, <laughs> yes. I mean, it, that it's, one of the, it's one of the curious questions of this, economic age that is how untouched by the internet financial intermediaries have been. Every other intermediary has been completely screwed by the internet, It'll right? It'll take time. It'll get there. Well, It'll get there. But, but how much time it's taken is kind of incredible. And that instead of, instead of the intermediary being knocked out of the system, they found ways to rig the system so there was a place for them. I mean, I wrote a book, Flash Boys, about this, and it, it's still true that there is just like lots of unnecessary hands touching money when, tra when financial transactions occur and taking little slices out. Rent, financial rents that are, economic rents that are completely unnecessary, uh, and they've just been kind of like hard baked into the system. That existing, in, that sort of like the people who are um, in the middle of things when change should have happened. We're pretty successful in stopping the change from having the effects it should have happened. And I like, I really like the idea that out of crypto could come a def, def, de, you know, the whole DeFi movement. And, and maybe it will happen. I hope it will happen. But there's a war before it happens, right? <laughs> and I've seen, I've seen glimpses of that war, and there's no one in my whole writing career. I've pissed off a lot of people in my writing career, often unintentionally. But um, I think it's true to say that in my whole writing career, I've never had anybody so angry at me as a Wall Street billionaire from whom I'm trying to take money. If I write something that's th at all threatening to the billionaire's profits, it just, it's like swatting the side of a hornet's nest. And it, it's, they, you think they'd be relaxed about it. They're billionaires, but they're billionaires because they're not relaxed about it. And, uh, and so I, I just, you know, I, it's, there's, it's not, it's not going to be a simple matter realizing the vision of Satoshi, right? Absolutely. I mean, uh, think we're here, we're am, here am I, I, I mean, am I wrong? I don't think so. Right. I think obviously we're, we're seeing lots of pushback all around the world and it's only going to get, you know, worse. I've written a lot about this in some of my pieces. Like, there's a whole system, there's a lot of debt, there's all this stuff, right? It's got to get paid for. There's a loss sitting there. Who's going to pay for it? Right. And usually what happens is the doors get closed 
and there's some people who were smart enough to get out, walk out the door when they could, yeah. and a lot of people wish they walked out the door. Uh, I think I, I did an interview with um, oh, a few days ago, and I, I said, yeah, there's, a, there's an arc called Bitcoin and you know, other things that you can invest that are outside of the system. Yep. Some people are going to be in the arc. Most people are going to drown, uh. Uh, unfortunately. Uh. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I definitely echo that sentiment. How much you, I mean, since I've got you here, how, what percentage of your assets are in some form of crypto? I mean, uh, obviously, I still own a large percentage of, of BitMEX, and that is a crypto company. Right. So, like, I'd say, like, 90-something percent. Okay. It's either, like, directly or a derivative of it, right? So, <laughs> here we go. Let, let's, let's throw some red meat out there. Uh, so, so, of the, do you own anything, anything but Bitcoin? Absolutely. Okay. I, I own a lot. Like, Ethereum. Lots of fucking shit coins. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, guys. Y'all know you trace a Pepe coin. Don't sit here like that. <laughs> um, the current banking, you know, the problems in the current banking system. I have a view of this. Like, what's, what's going on in American banking? It seems inherently unstable right now. Uh, and completely, we're still living in the world of the post-financial crisis. I mean, the, the whole problem that we have today is because of the solution they put in place it's after exactly 2008. Right. It's exactly right. You essentially created a, a handful of institutions where they're too big to fail, and everybody knows their deposits are insured, so no other institution can actually compete in Correct. that environment. And, I mean, this is a good example of the mistrust of the existing financial system, that a bank now, a regional bank, doesn't actually have to have done anything wrong at all. All they you bought have treasuries. To, they bought uh, real yeah, estate. All you have They're to, fucked. Uh, yeah, all you have to do <laughs> is, is create a whisper of a rumor around it, and it's irresponsible to have your money in it, and everybody flees. It's, never, it's not going to end until there's some structural reform, I don't think. Um, do you, I want to bounce a thought of you. Yes. This is just like me throwing stuff against the wall. But it's, um, there's kind of a crypto angle to the regional bank problems, I think. Okay, let's hear it, because I don't think so. But I, res I reserve the right to change my mind. I don't actually have a strong thought about it. But if you look at the banks that, that, went, that fell first, Silicon Valley Bank, yep. uh, Signature. Signature, Silvergate. Yep. Those were the original banks that were open to banking crypto. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank banked Coinbase first. I think that was the first. Uh, Silvergate banked FTX first. Um, and I think, I think the regulators, I think there was a, like a, they were a step slow and, a, and a, a step reluctant to step, to come in and help because they were irritated by the crypto relationships. Well, I, I think the problem is a little bit more structural than that, right? So the crypto and all of the tech companies were much flightier deposit based. So you had these yep, banks that that's were, right. they came up because, you know, JP Morgan yep. and City and Wells Fargo are not banking crypto. They're not giving loans to, right you know, startup founders right. and blah, 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 right? So you have these banks that cater to those businesses. Right. However, those deposits are very concentrated in an industry, and if something right. you know, happens and those leave quickly, then if you have an underlying structural problem with how you've matched done your liability yeah, yeah. management, well, which, that's going to be exposed right. immediately, right. right? And so what was the problem? They bought a bunch of treasuries and commercial real estate in 2020, 2021, yielding, you know, 2 to 3%. Uh, they can't pay up for deposits at 5% is what you can get in a money market fund. And so therefore, if all the deposits rush out the door, they have nothing to do. They're fucked. Right. They're underwater. The yield curve's inverted. Like, yeah. there's nothing you can do. Right. So, like, they were the first to go because their deposit base was very flighty and not that sticky. Right. But every other bank, apart from the, large, the eight too-big-to-fail banks, has the same problem because yep. over, the, and I think over the next, you know, six to 12 months, you're going to see people, like, pull out their phone and be like, okay, I get... 0.5% at XYZ Bank, I literally can lend money to the U.S. fucking government or the Federal Reserve, and I get 10 times my money in interest, 5%. Right, right. Why the fuck are you sitting here put your deposit there? There's no, it's just stupid. Right. It takes you like two minutes. You can watch a TikTok video and get paid more at the same time. Like, yeah. come on. Yeah. So, like, the, these deposits are going out the door. Right. It's just going to be, it's just time, right? So right now, it's like, oh, no. It, the, the beat the whatever BTFP whatever they call it that kind of solved the problem. No more banks are failing. It looks you know kind of okay. Give it six to twelve months. Right. People are like financially incentivized to lend the money to the government rather than a bank that's not explicitly backed by the government. Yep. And so 
it's just going to happen. It's going right. to take a little bit more time. The other, it is kind of a flaky idea, and you, it's like not provable either way. But it's just, it is. It's also strange. I don't think the idea of like bank run was on any. wasn't salient. It wasn't on any. Go back five years. Like nobody's thinking that's going to happen. Um, I think the run on the crypto institutions just raised the salience of the idea. Like all of a sudden, in a moment, an institution could vanish, and with it, my money. And millions of people watched their their funds just go up in smoke. Uh, and I think it made everybody a little edgier when the banking problems started. But I don't know how important that is. Anyway, I sidetracked us. You were asking me something, and I probably didn't answer the question. Uh, I don't even know. If yeah, all right. <laughs> uh, uh. So I mean, I track, backtrack a bit. You uh, sent a message to me through somebody like, hey, I'm in Hong Kong. Trying to learn about Sam and just you traveled to Hong Kong, right? You know, to, yeah. to like meet some people around there. Obviously, I live there. It's my heart and soul of the city. Yeah. I've spent basically my entire adult life there. Uh, started my, you know, BitMEX there and all that kind of stuff. Like, what did you think about the city? Well, it was the one place where both Sam Bankman-Fried and CZ would feel comfortable being, uh, <laughs> uh, it, uh, and that, that was interesting. And and for me, so when I'm working on a book like I'm working on now, and it. It aims to read like a piece of fiction. Like it aims to, when you pick it up, like if you didn't know anything about crypto, if you didn't even know who Sam Bankman Fried was, you might think, oh God, this is just a made up story. It's an incredible story, but it's just a made up story. And for me to do that well, I actually need to be in the environments. I need to see every environment. So I went to Hong Kong to, among other things, sneak into the old FTX offices which are obviously, they, they ceased to be the FTX offices a long time ago. But the offices where, say, Sam operated from, I had heard that they hadn't moved the desks, that it was just the same, it, it, and in fact, that was true. And I snuck in and- Is there a beanbag? The, the beanbag, there is still a beanbag in the Bahamas. Oh. That has, the, the beanbag is exact, the Bahamas is, has got a, um, the feeling of Pompeii. It's like, it's like they're, they're, they're spectacles on the desks. People ran. Everything is just the way it was. Um, the, the, there, there was a, the stuff had been removed because they had left the Hong Kong office years, two years ago. I mean, long ago. But I needed to see the environment they were operating in. And I needed to, there were a whole bunch of people I needed to talk to. Uh, and I thought, you know, the city's exciting. I'd never, I'd never seen it. I can see why you might like to live there. This kind of east, 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 west thing is very odd there. Of course, if you're operating a crypto business, there is always the question of like, are the Chinese government going to come in and remove you in the dark of night and nobody will ever see you again? That would worry me a bit right now. Uh, but, uh, but I was there for that reason. I was there for, for, for literary, cinematic reasons kind of thing. I just wanted to be able to describe the place. Awesome. So are you going to go back? What's that? Did you go back? Will I go back again? Yeah. Just you, know what I, you know what I would like to do? Um, when the book, the book comes out October, the book comes out the day the trial starts, assuming there is a trial. Um, you don't think there is going to be a trial? I don't think so. I, I, bet, I would bet on it right. not happening. So, um, and I would like to go and to the places that were very helpful to me and where FTX was meaningful too, uh, to do book events. So I'm gonna go to the Bahamas and do uh, a big event. And I, I maybe at some point we'll go to Hong Kong too. I, it, it, yes, it's, it's, it's a thrilling place, right? It's just like, you, feel, you said to me, you feel, it felt like the world was being in, kind of reinvented there or invented there. This has felt like the edge of existence. And I, I can see why you felt that way. Um, but my purposes were really narrow. I was just trying to get to know, I, was get to, I just needed to be able to describe where my characters were functioning. Yeah, makes sense. We, we talked a little bit about how you think that uh, the culture of Bitcoin at least is like very religious almost. Um, and obviously you've done some uh, investigative reporting on certain things. Uh, and well, I'll tell you about the feeling I have. It's, it's um, is that you can say something wrong. Like, I'm kind of agnostic. By nature, I'm not thinking, do I believe, do I not believe? Or am I in or am I out? I'm naturally walking into situations and just watching. Like, I'm just observing and looking for a, this, what is the story I want to tell here. And I've had cases with books where I've 
it, it feels, the, this is a case that feels more this way than, than, than crypto. But when I wrote The Blind Side, um, I'm not a believing man. Like, I, I was raised an atheist. That sounds weird, but it's completely true. My father told me when I was a little boy, it's all hocus pocus. Don't believe any of it. And I said, okay, the it's all hocus pocus. Santa Claus real too, the Easter Bunny. Yeah, 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 all, all gone. My, so I was just like raised without religion, which is it, just, you know, some people are. When I was working on the blind side, my main characters were all evangelical Christians. And I was very sympathetic towards them, right? Adored them, loved them. Uh, but they were sus a little suspicious of me because they sensed I did not share their belief structure. We got through that. We got through that fine in the course of like working on the book and I was able to write the book and write whatever I wanted to and they let their guard down and I got what I needed. But when the book came out, it met, it met with a wall of disapproval because the subtitle was Evolution of a Game. And Christian booksellers were looking for like, oh, he's, they're just so used to people rolling into evangelical Christian land, pretending to be a Christian, phoning up, whatever, and selling them stuff. They thought, he believes in evolution. We're not stocking the book. So it was, a, it was an odd case where my absence of like, like sharing the, the belief experience caused problems for the story. And I really hope that doesn't happen with this because it isn't that like I'm in or out on Bitcoin. It's just like I just haven't really thought much about like where I stand on the whole thing. The car and, the, and it's almost, it doesn't matter what I think. Like it doesn't matter whether I believe in God when I'm writing The Blind Side. It matters what they believe. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether Sam, whether I believe like crypto is going to run the world one day or not. It matters what Sam Beckman fried and the people around him believe. My, my beliefs are a matter of real inconsequence and should just be kept to one side anyway. So I, but I smell it because I've interviewed, I don't know, 200 people. And there are, this, you, weren't, you weren't like this, but quite a few of them are like, what are you going to say about Bitcoin? Or what are you going to say about crypto? And like, I don't know what I'm going to say about crypto. I'm not going to say anything about crypto. Sam bankman free is going to say stuff about crypto. And, uh, and they're, like, they're just kind of like, where, where are you in this debate? And it's interesting. It's like a religious thing that, in that, you know, you're, I was raised not to talk about politics or religion at the dinner table. Like, you just didn't do it because it led nowhere good. You know, crypto should be added to the list. Uh, it's, it's like, it's like I, guess, I guess it really depends on what part of the cycle, because a lot of people like to talk about it when, you know, they look at their phone and everything's up, but, you know. But in, but in any case, these, these wars have emerged that are, that are that they're beyond the actual argument. They're emotional. They're, they're, they end up being rooted in kind of a, some sort of emotion that isn't being stated. And it's it's... It's the feeling of an outsider with an insider. It's a, whatever it is is going on. And so you just, people just look like they're very, I can tell when I'm talking to them, they're sensitive in the way evangelicals were when I was interviewing them about the family in the middle of the blind side. It's like they first wanted to know that I was an evangelical before they talked to me. And there's been some of that with crypto. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's our, I, I have to kind of like say, does, you're worrying about the wrong thing. It, what I think doesn't matter. What I, it just doesn't matter. But has anyone sort of persuaded you in terms of to actually care a little bit more, or is it more like, this is really interesting, and I know, it's, you're an interesting person, very smart. And you want to have, you don't want an environment where people don't care about anything. I mean, one of the really interesting, I mean, it's like, there are a million interesting things about this story, but watching people who were completely outside the, the movement come into the movement and decide, what it is they thought was good about it and what they thought was bad about it. What they started to really care about and what they didn't care about. Um, that it, it, the FTX people, I mean, they were not, in the end, like crypto skeptics or anything. They weren't there kind of just using crypto for their own purposes. It may have started that way, but, but they got swept up in it in different ways. And, uh, and so uh, that, that's good. You know, that's good in, a, in, in people you're writing about, that they care about what they're doing. Um, but anyway, my takeaway from it all is like, uh, it's, it's so hard not to feel warm and fuzzy about a world that's given you such a great story.
<laughs> that, that, that it, this, that, and I wonder, it, having had this experience with, with... I think you're going to be writing more books about us. Well, I think... I, 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 no, so, so if you look at my financial books, Liar's Poker, The Big Short, Flash Boys, and this will be the next one. Every one is linked to the one before it. Um, the Big Short is, is, a, is sort of a bookend to Liar's Poker. It's sort of like, this, ha this is where this world I was describing ended. The Big Short characters put me onto Flash Boys. The first thing after the book comes out, they're like, you're, th that something is happening in the stock markets that you need to know about. And it was the Flash Boys people who first told me about Sam. And, uh, and so I have no doubt that it'll be five years from now that something from this book will lead to another book. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if it was in, it was in crypto land. Maybe it will be about you. <laughs> you know, I mean, you just never know, right? Uh, you never know. You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to get into some more trouble. <laughs> you're gonna have to cause more, a little more trouble. You haven't done enough. <laughs> you haven't done enough. Um, but, um, you, but you are part of an expression, and uh, of a, of a movement within the movement. We're being told we gotta have yeah. to go on. I know but that where you come out of traditional finance, right? You're bringing tools from traditional finance and, and, and uh, uh, insinuating them into crypto world. That movement's interesting to me. Uh, I don't know if there's another book in it, but it's a movement that is interesting to me. So I guess before they-, which, they what, should, what should we end on? Like, uh, the writing process. So I, I write, obviously, a blog. I really enjoy writing it, you know? It probably takes me a good day or so to write one of these, like, 30 minute long essays that I publish and like, you know. And you do well, have your views. Oh yes, yeah, I yeah, have my yeah, views. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it or not, yeah. that, that's the point. Um, people are always like, you should write a book, you should write a book. I'm like, well, I don't know, I'm not very disciplined about this. Like, it's kind of like I have an idea and I sit down and you know, I bash it out and then like I'm spent and then you know, go away for a few weeks and then I'll have another idea and, and, and write something. But we were talking backstage and like, you have a very regimented process for how you get through a I have timely to, fashion. I have to be scared to death before I actually put down, where I have to know that there's a deadline, there's a gun to my head, and the words have to be in then. I'm just too lazy. Like, I will just fuck around. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 I just, and I'll think, I'll have a million reasons why I can't do it. Um, what has to happen with me, with every, with every book, every book that's been any good has exactly the same emotional slash psychological process preceding it. And it's this, and it's just happened with this subject. It happened on November the 8th, or whatever it was. Um, I have to feel that not only do I have a gun to my head and I have to produce the words, but it's worth doing. I have to feel like it's no longer, oh, I have, I'm Michael Lewis author, I have to write a book. I don't have to write a book. The world has too many books. Uh, that I have to feel that the material that I, for whatever reason, have been gifted with is so good that I have an obligation to do this. Like, never mind if I'm paid for it, never mind if anybody reads it right away, I've got, to, it's an obligation. And so that feeling gets me into the chair, and once I'm in the chair, I need the gun to the back of my head <laughs> telling me when the words need to be out of, of my computer. But, and that's my process. That's it. Interesting. Well, I guess. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank Total you. Pleasure. The Bitcoiners, welcome back to the Bitcoin Magazine Live Desk presented by Marathon. I'm CK. I'm here with an excellent panel. We have Zuby, we have Bill Middle the Fourth, we have Anthony Scaramucci, and what a day! Day one of GA day one of Bitcoin 2023 has been thermodynamic savings, RFK's incredible announcement, the Bitcoin ordinal debate, Bitcoin energy in the state, Tulsi Gabbard's keynote, and now this fireside chat with Michael Lewis and Arthur Hayes, another classic on the day. Gentlemen, let's just jump into it. I thought this was a really fascinating conversation. They kind of hit on a lot of things, whether it's specifically the story about FTX that Michael Lewis is writing. They jumped into how Michael Lewis is thinking about Bitcoin and even uh, the pressure to say the right things when you're talking to Bitcoiners about Bitcoin. Zuby, let's start with you. What was your impression of the conversation? It was interesting. I mean, being a creator myself and also being an author, um, I understood a lot of what Michael was saying about, you know, I think as a creator, sometimes you need to be 
a little bit detached from the, from the material that you're writing about and you don't want to always, it depends on the type of book you're writing. If you're telling a story, you don't want to be injecting all of your own thoughts and opinions and ideas and ideology into it. Um, you really just want to document it and have fun with the story. So he takes that more detached perspective. I think that's why he was talking about, you know, not wanting to get involved with inserting his ideas about Bitcoin or being a Bitcoiner and so on. Uh, but yeah, overall, I think it was a, it was a dope conversation. Bill, uh, do you read uh, any, uh, any of the classics by Michael Lewis? Uh, are you excited for this upcoming novel? I am excited about it. I love Michael Lewis's work. I think one of the most interesting themes of what we've been seeing and hearing over the past couple sessions is this notion of truth and transparency. And it keeps coming up. And that's what's so cool about Bitcoin is the fact that it is more transparent, more truthful, more out there and public than any other monetary form in history. And that's why it's so compelling and interesting. And then you uh, jump in here. You know, un unfortunately, I'm in the book. You know, it was a big part of my life last year. Uh, Sam really, you know, heard us. And obviously, we did Crypto Bahamas with him. I sat with Michael at several dinners, one of which was with uh, President Clinton and Tony Blair. Uh, I think it will be interesting to see, but Michael was fond of Sam. And I will tell you that I was also fond of Sam. So as this thing unfolded on November 7th and 8th, the sort of TikTok of that was very painful. And I had the opportunity to speak to Michael in the aftermath of that. He almost came with us to Saudi Arabia and to Dubai and Abu Dhabi on that very faithful trip. And of course, you guys will remember Sam was out on that trip. He was saying some things about CZ that got him upset. Five, six days later, after we came out of the Middle East, CZ hit him with a bag of FTT tokens. And then you got to see the whole hornet's nest unravel, that sort of... Uh, nefarious thing that they were doing together. So it'll be interesting to see how Michael frames the narrative. But like me, I believe Michael Lewis liked Sam Bankman Freed in the beginning and thought he was well-intentioned. So Anthony, let's stick with you. What's the lesson of FTX from your perspective? Well, I think the number one lesson would be for everybody here, every investor, crimes get committed by small groups of people. And so when you're putting your money into a centralized exchange or something like that, you have to make sure there's a very large group of people that are looking after your money. In the case of FTX, there were four cohorts, three of which have already pled out guilty. Uh, and if you look at the Bernie Madoff situation, it was him, his brother, an assistant, an accountant over the Davinzy Bridge. Uh, you have to put your money in a place where there's administrators and justifiable accountants and lawyers, and there's a large group of people where a person of conscience will always be available to spill the beans on the malevolent people. And I think that's the big lesson of SP the SBF crisis, the FTX bankruptcy, and in general, financial fraud. So we only have a minute left here. I want to get another opinion from both Zuby and Bill. Bill, let's go with you. What does all of this have to do with Bitcoin? If you can do that in 30 seconds, go for it. FTX has very little to do with Bitcoin because most people that are looking to commit frauds want to do it under a veil of secrecy, which is what Anthony was just saying. And so... Um, it has very little to do with Bitcoin, and that's why Bitcoin's phenomenal. Zuby, last word. Well, as people always say, don't trust, verify, right? I think uh, that stands all the time, and it's especially highlighted with that type of situation. So I think people need to also beware of any type of, you know, get-rich-quick sort of schemes. If it sounds too good to be true, make sure you don't trust and definitely verify. It seems verify. like that lesson yeah. is learned over and over again, even by, you know, who would be the, the wisest of us. 